Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jose Luis Ortega. I'm an associate professor at the University of Granada uh, in Spain and the Spanish language scientific director in Common Ground Research Networks. Uh, well, these strange times bring us uh, to difficult situations. This is a presentation, the visual presentation that should be you know, face to face with a face to face interaction. But well, uh, hopefully we will go back to this traditional view of the conferences and uh, hopefully we will meet again soon. By the way, I can tell you that we will be back in Valencia at the University of Valencia and the Polytechnic uh, in 2022. Well, I wish you all well and health and uh, I'm going to start with the presentation today. The title is Bilingual Education in a Non-Bilingual Context and well, why this title? It is because my university and the city where I live, Granada, are in Andalusia. In Andalusia, uh, English has been the means of instruction now for years. Uh, we've been working on bilingualism for more than 20 years. And um, English is a key issue in our education system. We have more than 1,000 uh, uh, bilingual schools. And um, we have this bilingual education in a non-bilingual context. I mean, we, we don't have a, a context where our students can go after school time and practice what they have learned. I mean, they will have to practice the whole thing at school. So let's start now. And uh, well, the, the main thing here is to know who we are. I mean, we are involved here, teachers, we are students, we are families. We have, we have the administration, the inspection service, head teachers, principals coordinators, plus, I mean, that's a, a very nice bunch of people, plus researchers, and all those who think that have something to say in education. Many people have many things to say in education. And every day more and more, our teachers have a big concern. I mean, what they're doing, which is their daily work. And uh, they have more papers to fill, more bureaucracy, more plans to design. And some of the basic ideas of a bilingual teacher in this context has to bear in mind are, for example, the activation of the period knowledge. And for that, we need, we're going to need the, the, the mother tongue, something that I will repeat several times in this presentation. And concerning the input and the output, teachers need to plan the input. This is the information that is being presented in the CLIL class. They will have to see if it's going to be delivered orally or in writing or on a paper or electronically. If what they're going to do is for the whole class, if it is going to be group work or pair work. Now, and especially after the coronavirus, if it is going to be online, or if it's going to include practical demonstrations. We teachers, primary and secondary teachers, need to plan for learners' output. They will have to think on how learners are going to produce and combine the content and the language used along the lesson. And there is a, a good question now, which is, what is success for them? What is success for students? Question to think about. And one thing that they have also, and that they need to be trained on, is this of their waiting time. When subjects are taught in a non-native language, a longer wait time than usual is needed. So teachers and administrations now are putting high emphasis on, for example, collaborative tasks. They include tasks that involve learners in producing key subject specific vocabulary and structures in meaningful pair or group work activities. Tasks may be at words level, for example, a pair work information gap or leveling activity, or at sentence level, pairs can ask and answer questions about different body organs. Bilingualism means, and this is clear, a cognitive challenge for both teachers and students especially because learners need to communicate not only the everyday functional language practiced in many English classes, but they also need to communicate the cognitive academic language of school subjects. Easy sentences such as plants need water so that or so they can live, or plants need water in order to or to live, mean a clear combination of collaborative work between subject teachers and non-linguistic teachers and the linguistic teachers. So our students will be developing thinking skills. They're lots and lots. They're lower order 
thinking skills when they have to use less complex language. For example, when they say what, when, where, which, they give answers to these questions. Or the higher order, when they have to answer questions such as why this happened or how do you explain this. For that, they're going to need more complex language. Bilingualism. And there is a distinction made by Garcia and Bertsmore um, between active bilingualism and receptive bilingualism. The first describes the productive use of two languages, while receptive bilingualism could be a mere passive understanding of another language. Valdez, for example, sees the difference between the concept of active bilingualism, which is based on competency assessment, going from the mythical bilingualism, that which has been considered as the perfect one, in which speakers are fully balanced in any possible situation, to the possibility of having different levels of competencies in two languages in different situations. Learners, this is users, will have different levels of proficiency in the two languages over one's lifetime. Any context, just to finish with this slide, will make us rethink our teaching procedures. The context where we teach, not only if in a bilingual context or not, but also in different school contexts within it, will make us rethink our procedures. Is this bilingual teaching always good? Do all the agents involved have a positive idea of this? Let's see some of the pros and cons that will have an influence on the rest of this presentation. Pros, well, of course, it's going to be easier for children to learn a second language. It's going to enhance the first language if we allow the use of this first language, mainly. It will provide children with future opportunities. Learning one new language is going to make easier learning more languages, of course. And for me, one of the most important things is the perception of a school that families have. This is absolutely important. Constraints, always. We can mention some, but I want to highlight three. There may be a lack of qualified teachers and assistants. We have very good teachers excellent teachers in primary and secondary education. But now we need teachers who are trained, not only on the language, but also on how to teach using the language, or vice versa. We, need, we have very good content subject uh, teachers who are really good teaching their subjects in their mother tongue, and now they need to be trained on how to do this with a foreign language. Families can have a negative idea of bilingualism because sometimes they create higher expectations. This is another thing that is a big concern, and it could be the mismanagement of differentiation, how we cope with diversity. And again, school management and organization, which is key. I mean, a school that is properly run, organized, managed, is going to have much better results than those who do not have theirs. In this interesting uh, interview, with Professor David March, published by the International House Journal of Education and Development. There are some ideas that I want to bring today. For example, he says here that exposure to CLIL enhances the first language. Absolutely good. Excellent, especially for those who are against this type of education. And he adds, CLIL is not just teaching in a foreign language. Clearly involves doing this using specific methodologies and expertise. And this accommodates the first language. Excellent. So we have two more reasons. But there is another one that I want to highlight. And this is here, the last sentence here. This is one mechanism to diminish such frustration. Which one? Translanguaging. The use of different languages in these lessons. Language means culture. Do not forget that. So we're going to combine, we're going to have the perfect combination if we do things properly. Well, all of this has provoked, in Spain especially, debate and controversy. We have 17 different uh, communities in our country with different political uh, ideas concerning education and especially concerning this of the teaching of languages. We have different ways to proceed. We don't have a basis that is set in common because we can make a distinction. I mean, we have some communities that have their own mother tongue. I mean, they have their own language, for example, Valencia, or we have uh, Catalonia or Galicia or the Basque country. But here, 
they will understand bilingualism in a different, with a different idea than we do when we think of a bilingualism with a foreign language. There is not a methodology recommended. We have less fundings every day, more and more. And this is a big concern also. And this is going to provoke what Marisa Perez Cañado calls the pendulum effect. And that I really like this idea. We have people who are absolutely enthusiastic with this of bilingualism and those other who show a complete rejection. Is clear the solution for our problems? Well, according to Do Coyle, and she knows a bit about uh, the bilingual education, Andalusia is a model to follow. And that's something that we have to consider also. There are no methodological guidelines. That could be one of the main problems and one of the reasons that we should have and that we uh, should bear in mind of why we work with very good results in some schools and some communities and not so good results in some schools in other communities or in the same uh, communities. Let's take a quick view to some of these norms from which we highlight the importance given to the school linguistic project, how evaluation is considered, or the need to address the bilingual education to all students, also for those with special needs. These kids cannot be left behind. That would be absolutely terrible. And see, in terms of evaluation, how there is like a distinction in this bilingual education in a non-bilingual context. The content is the, the, the non-linguistic uh, teachers will evaluate only the content. They will not evaluate the oral production or the written production. So it's going to be difficult for them to make a distinction, to split evaluation in those terms. I mean, how can I evaluate the oral production or how they explain how this task or this project is, uh, has been developed uh, without paying attention to the, the, the way in which they uh, communicate. So something also that could be, uh, well, reconsidered. For all these reasons, uh, it is clear that schools must be properly organized and that organization is not always easy. And um, those from those four times that I published in, back in 2015, school organization is one of the most important. These are the, the main ideas that um, school managers have to bear in mind and big concerns that they have. And we have studied this in different uh, researches. For example, they will have to coordinate teachers. Teachers that teach foreign languages and teachers that teach content uh, subjects. And they will need this coordination. Communication with the students and families absolutely essential. Families need to be reported of what is happening at school, which are the real expectations, which activities are going to be organized. Teacher training in languages and clear methodology. This is one, again, of the concerns that head teachers mainly have in uh, high schools and primary schools. Construction of workable policies and control of results. We need to do evaluation of ourselves on what we're doing and which proposals we can do for the next year, and the creation and maintenance of content, contacts beyond the boundaries of a school. This means that it is not only to create links between our school and schools abroad, which is excellent, which is absolutely good. It is that we need to see how other schools, maybe near ours, are working. And if they're doing well, we need to share experiences with them. We need visits from those uh, teachers in those schools and share experiences telling us what to do and why they have succeeded. Well, we thought after all these things that a checklist was needed. The origins of the checklist for improvement of bilingual programs came as a result of the national study undertaken in Spain by all the two colleagues, Stephen Hughes and Daniel Madrid and me and myself, back in 2018, with the support of the Spanish Ministry of Education and the British Council, and a team of experts in language and bilingual instruction. Given the different dimensions involved in bilingual education, the initial stages of this proposal deal with the question of quality in education, quality in language learning, and quality in bilingual instruction, and the elaboration of the checklist itself went through these five phases. All of this, considering that ours is not a bilingual context and that the schools should be prepared to provide the context 
that cannot be found out of the school facility. In the first step, the major categories that could have a potential impact on bilingual learning were identified. Once identified, a group of 30 experts in bilingual education were surveyed in an open response questionnaire in order to ascertain which aspects of each area could best reflect high quality practices within the bilingual school. The responses from these questionnaires were then coded into the initial item checklist, which was then revised, adjusted and validated by a reduced group of 10 experts, including language and bilingual education experts, a representative of the Ministry of Education and a representative from the British Council. The final set of instruments of this study included separate but related questionnaires for head teachers, bilingual coordinators, bilingual content teachers, language teachers and students, as well as complementary interview questions for school leaders. We'll see now the major categories employed in the checklists for schools, which include leadership for learning, program coordination, bilingual or plurilingual culture, resources planning, delivery and assessment, and of course, results. It should be remembered that while such instruments may have a certain value in helping schools to detect strong points in areas of improvement, ideally, they would form part of a larger group of tools and procedures that could range from observation of teaching and learning to the use of interviews with key participants in the process, among all the possible measures. These are, in short, the categories used for the checklist and that gives schools a real vision on how to proceed and which aspects should be rethought and or discussed. The first category is this of leadership for learning. Well, leaders, mainly head teachers, or people from the administration, and or and people from the administration. We need people who are really engaged in this idea of the bilingual education, especially when they have to combine families and they have to combine all the teachers, they have to combine our colleagues of the benefits of working with this bilingual education. We need leaders who give recognition to those who work hard. We need leaders who listen and respond to the initiative. Of course, they have sufficient knowledge of the area. They are going to inform the school community. They will do a newsletter. They will update the website with the school website with information related to this program. They're going to measure the student and teacher satisfaction. And of course, if possible, they will have the money. The second category is this of the bilingual coordinator or program manager. Of course, here now, we need someone with a sufficient mastery. We need someone with um, the ability to use the language, English, French, or the language that is used in that school to have contacts with other schools abroad, for example, to participate in international projects, for example. If possible, previous experience, only if that is possible. People who really coordinate, people who know very well the meaning of the word coordination. And of course, they need to know the clear methodological principles because they will have to transmit them. They will have to over to do kind of revision of what is done and they need to know very well how this is done. The third category is this of the bilingual and plurilingual atmosphere. We need activities at school that tell people, that tell families that we are in a good project, that we are working hard and that this is going to have good results. The work and the use of tasks and projects, that's beautiful. Many schools are working now with this and especially beautiful and useful when we work using this clear methodology. Tasks that can be done within the classroom with our students, not only a task for a subject, but tasks with this interdisciplinary vision. And projects, when we break the classroom walls and we leave the classroom and we go and work with others, and we are not only working with our level, but with the different levels in this high school or primary school. Projects in which the society, the environment, the school community is evolved. We need international projects. International projects that could come with a visit to other schools, if possible. Now it's not the best time for, for this of visiting. And exchanges 
of course, if possible, and if we have the age, if these students have the age to go abroad to visit other schools, other realities, it's going to be absolutely beneficial for them. The fourth category is this of the human and material resources. Well, of course, we need teachers with a high level of communicative competence. We don't need people, I'm sorry, teachers with a C2 level that is going to be necessary, but maybe a C1 level is going to be good to make them feel confident that they can use the language in a classroom. We need to train them on classroom language and how to use the language in the classroom, how to communicate with the students, not only to, to, uh, for the daily actions, but also how to teach, how to um, make this content easy for these students when using a foreign language. We need training, we need teachers, probably trained in differentiation. And of course, if we have conversation assistants or native teachers, remember that sometimes these are, these are students coming from other countries and the, not, not always uh, are really teachers. I mean, they are students of economics or some other subjects and they come uh, to Spain to help, to support, to um, well, be part of the school, but they don't have the skills to be teachers. So we have to work hard on them also and the materials and resources that any school will need. The fifth category is this of planning, delivery, and assessment of learning. Of course, I mentioned this before, but at the beginning, when I talked about this of the uh, integrated bilingual plan, the clear methodological principles have to be there present in our schemes of work, in the development of our units of work, if possible, integrated units of work, the role given to evaluation, and how this evaluation is going to be absolutely clear for teachers in terms of this is the evaluation of the contents, this is the evaluation of the, uh, um, the production of the oral or written production. And improvement proposals always. I mean, when we finish the school year, these teachers have to meet, have to be led uh, by the um, uh, coordinator, or by the head teacher, and they make what worked, what didn't work, or didn't work as suspected, and then which proposals can be done for the coming year. The sixth category has to do with the results. And here we have the, let's say, traditional results of the oral skills and reading skills in terms of language. And also with this of the linguistic subject, of course, and the non-linguistic subjects. And this is one of the big concerns of those who are against bilingual education in these non-bilingual contexts. Why? Because they think that our students are not going to reach the level that they were supposed if they were learning using the mother tongue. So that's again something that we have to cope with, we have to study, we have to think of, and we have to give solutions. The results in non-linguistic subjects have to be measured and if any change is needed, they have to be carried out. Interaction and mediation. Now those two terms that come with a companion volume that appear in the common European framework but from 2001, but now are key with the accompanying volume. This interaction, the, 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 the use, I mean, how they can explain things of the mediation, how they help others to understand these uh, things that they are studying. We have to see after the results, if our students are satisfied with what we're doing. Of course, if teachers, if we have students and teachers that are not motivated, this hardly is going to work. So we need, to work on this and see if they are really motivated. And for that, we need surveys, we need uh, interviews, we need to talk to teachers and students, of course, with the school community. And that includes families also. And as I mentioned before, their proposals to improve. Well, there's one, only one slide to mention the need of the um, differentiation. And in this paper that we just published uh, this year, um, this chapter of the book, there we see as final uh, conclusions that social differences are not positive, that diversity appears as a subject at universities in 1985, that sometimes this subject is very theoretical and we need something more specific. We need training on how to cope with diversity in the bilingual classroom. Uh, classroom. So we need to know very well how to proceed with these students because now they have the, let's say, the, the problem or the, 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 the 
the, yeah, the difficulties they have to achieve the proposed contents using their mother tongue. So now it's going to be harder if they have to use a foreign language. So we have to train our teachers from universities. We have to train our teachers on how to proceed with these students. And just to conclude, well, let me tell you that one main thing here is the improvement of teacher training. We need to consider planning and design not something that we simply have to do because the administration requires this, but it is something that we have to do because it covers the whole thing. I mean, it, it's going to, to tell families how we work. It's going to tell us what we can do. It's going to tell students how we're going to evaluate, for example. So planning and design, absolutely necessary. The use of the mother tongue as a positive tool, as a motivating tool, to avoid frustration as much as, uh, as I mentioned before, the need of uh, pre-service training, especially in the differentiation, and not only in the pre-service training, also in the in-service training, in the continuous development. We need these specific courses telling people what to do in different situations that could appear in any a classroom at any school. And of course, in terms of culture and atmosphere to make these schools really look these bilingual schools remember and again that we are in a non-bilingual school and our students do not have the opportunity of going out and uh, share experiences with others and um, well several schools in spain have undergone by now a long and arduous process of initiating and gradually improving the implementation of bilingual and in some cases plurilingual programs other schools are just beginning their journey in both cases, different members of the school community are likely to see bilingual programs with varying degrees of enthusiasm or apathy, to see them as a vehicle for progress or one that will constrain learning, as I mentioned before. Ignoring the challenges and potential pitfalls in bilingual education would appear to be just as bad as ignoring the potential benefits. What appears to be important, however, is the need for decision making, which is evidence-based. Each learning context is different, but it is possible to identify several areas which can potentially bring high levels of success. At this point in our checklist, we offer a series of initial questions for reflection based on issues identified by a series of experts. The list of questions is a tentative one and by no means exhaustive. Instead, the issues mentioned represent a starting point for dialogue and discussion, and eventually for creative thinking and action. The detection of strong points and areas of improvement requires a number of fundamental ingredients. Firstly, there is a need for commitment, primarily by school leadership, but also from subject teachers, students, and families. This commitment arises perhaps in part from the availability of precise and objective information from both inside and outside the school in terms of school-based program evaluation and external evidence provided by wider works of research. A further issue linked to this commitment is the creation of a bilingual or plurilingual culture within the school. This culture has the potential to motivate students and to help them see the value of the project. Effective bilingual teaching not only depends on levels of linguistic competence, pedagogical ability, methodological expertise and legislative compliance. The ability to communicate and coordinate, to participate in projects, to identify strengths and areas of improvement and act upon information that has been gathered are also essential traits to give a program the best possible chance of success. Among all these areas, however, it is ultimately the results which point to a program's effectiveness. Results both academic and non-academic can underscore areas which have been successful and which can serve as a basis upon which to build. They can also indicate failings and shortcomings and help those directly involved to identify solutions. To a large degree, all of these processes bring us back to the first key area, which is that of informed leadership and commitment. In this presentation, and just to finish, I have attempted to provide those in charge of a specific bilingual learning contexts with a series of general areas and more specific questions. These questions may serve as a starting point 
for reflection and could lead to the identification of a series of more precise and contextualized questions that could lead to solutions that are not only evidence-based, but are also tailor-made to fit the individual school. Thank you very much for your attention.